So the teleos are by far the most speciose of these groups. But within the teleos, the subset of those that is by far the most diverse is the euteleosii, or true teleos. Now, there's 19, more than 19,000 species of these, and they're incredibly diverse. Um, and here's a, some of them here. Now, uh, I just want to give you some really cool examples of really, really cool euteleosii. So you see the types of fish that was in this group including um, the uh, mud skipper in the upper left, fam left, upper left, famous for coming out of the water and courting out of the water and spending most of their lives out of the water walking around on their uh, pectoral fins, but they still have to reproduce in the water. And there's cool videos of them leaping, like turning on their sides and jumping up to attract females and uh, interact with each other and fighting out of the water. Uh, I've seen them in Japan, they're super cool. In the lower left, you have the archer fish, which stays below the water and spits out a, a spray of water to knock insects into the water to forage on. Uh, then you have the angler fishes below that, which the massive females and the parasitic males that are fused to the female, uh, which are basically just a bag of gonads that provide sperm for the female in this low density environments of the deep ocean. So if a male and a female have so much difficulty contacting each other, when they do contact each other, they've evolved such that the male will just grab onto the female and never let go. And actually the uh, circulatory systems fuse and the male gets all his nutrition and gets rid of his waste through the female's blood system. Uh, you have the cool red-lipped batfish on the right, which kind of walks around on its pectoral and pelvic fins. In this case, the, pector the pelvic fins are sort of up in front of the pectoral fins, which is a cool modification. You have the four-eyed fish, which is specialized for looking out of the water and in the water. It has two separate retinas. And you have the gulper eel in the middle with its head and mouth is bigger than the whole rest of its body combined. And a whole series of flat fishes in the upper right, where in larval form, the eyes start on the side of the head, both sides of the head as a normal fish. But then as they develop and metamorphose, one eye moves up on top of the head like this, and then they lie down on their side and spend the whole rest of their lives as adults lying on their side on the bottom uh, with both eyes on, on, the, on the up side of the fish. Many, many, many cool TDOs. Okay, so that was the huge branch of Actinopterygii or raid fin fishes. Now we're going to spend a little bit of time on the lobe fin fishes or Sarcopterygii because these also then include all of the subsequent uh, tetrapods that you're going to hear about in subsequent lectures. Okay, so this branch split off from Actinopterygii more than 440 million years ago. And here you have these fleshy pectoral and pelvic fins that have a single basal skeletal element that extends into the fin. So that's our, our um, humerus and our femur. So now let's take that one line there and let's expand that and look at the two fish groups within Sarcopterygii. Uh, and then in subsequent lectures, you'll see the rest of the tetrapod groups that came off of fish within Sarcopterygii. So there's a phylogeny of Sarcopterygii with the two fish groups on the left I want to talk about, the Actinistia or Cetocanths and the Dipnoa, which is the lung fishes. And then you have the other vertebrate groups and tetrapod groups that you're going to talk about in subsequent lectures. Now here is only uh, six species, one in Australia, one in South America, and four in Africa. They look quite different from each other, but they share a number of general features. They're found in fresh water. They have a powerful jaw that they use to crush things, like invertebrates. Uh, they do much of their respiration via their lungs, and for the African species, it's actually obligate. Uh, and one cool thing about them is that they can naturally estivate in burrows for up to six months during the dry season. So in the lower left there, you have sort of a mucus-covered Longfish is basically burrowed down into the mud during the dry season and encased itself and just gone into chill mode for six months and not fed, very low metabolism, just hanging out waiting for the rains to come back. We have uh, some lungfish burrows uh, in the Red Path Museum, which we would show you if we could actually physically bring you into the labs. So coelacanths were ex thought to be, known to be extinct for something like 50 million years. No one has seen a single coelacanth in the fossil record for 50 million years. They used to be super, super common. And so that was all they were known from. There was no branch. That branch did not go to the present. But 
There's a super cool story about uh, a woman by the name of Marjorie Courtney Latimer, who was found in a, who worked in a very small museum called the East London Museum in South Africa. And she was the curator of this museum, and she had a deal with the local trawlers who would go offshore and catch fish to bring her cool fish that she could put in her museum. Now, on Christmas Eve in 1938, she got a call that the trawler had come in, and if she wanted to come and look at the fish on the trawler. She didn't really want to go, because she was, it was Christmas Eve, but she figured, well, I'll go down and wish them a Merry Christmas. And so she went there, and she was looking around the deck, and she couldn't see anything interesting. It was just a bunch of sharks and everything. And then out from under the pile, she saw a blue fin sticking out. And they pulled it out, and she looked at it, and immediately had this feeling that she might be looking at a coelacanth, even though one had never been seen by anyone for 50 million years living. And this was 1938, East London, Christmas Eve, and she it was a big fish, and she didn't have any way to get it back to her museum. She tried to call the cab. Cab didn't want to take it. She didn't have enough formalin to preserve it. And so she did uh, just some quick sketches like this one here and preserved what she could. And she sent this sketch off to a ichthyologist uh, at the uh, university um, and said, what do you think this is? And the guy flipped out and said, oh my God, it's uh, J.L.B. Smith was his name. He was like, oh my God, save it, save it, save it. And she's like, well, it, it's too late. But he went and came and looked at it and said, yes, that's definitely a coelacanth. But they'd only, no one had ever, they'd only ever been one ever found. So they put up a whole bunch of notifications giving rewards for finding of a coelacanth anywhere along the coast of Africa. A fisherman caught one of these things and one of the local people recognized it and saw the reward and so started telegramming, uh, telegraphing to J.L.B. Smith saying, we think we've got one of your things. This was again Christmas Eve. Now J.L.B. Smith, they remember there'd only been one ever found. So he's freaking out about this. He's like, oh my God, we gotta get that thing, but it's over in French territory. How are we gonna get it out without the French finding out? Uh, and so he tried everything he could to figure out a way to get it back to South Africa. But he'd run out of options, and so there's a really funny story about him saying that he's going to have to ha overcome his aversion to prime ministers. And actually, he telephoned the prime minister at his Christmas vacation home. And he called on Christmas Eve, or thereabouts, and he calls, and his wife picks up the phone, the, the prime minister's wife, and says, Oh, I'm sorry, he can't come to the phone right now, he's gone to bed. Turns out that he had heard her on the call and he said, who was that? And she said, oh, it's that Professor J.L.B. Smith. He, he, he says he has something that he needs your help with. And the guy said, oh, well, didn't you bring that book of his about fishes uh, on vacation? Can I see it? And so he got the book and looked at it and said, you know, this professor would not be contacting me unless it was something really important. So he called them back, and J.L.B. Smith said, yeah, 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 please, we've got this thing in the Comoros Islands. And so they sent a military plane to retrieve it from the Comoros Islands, trying to get in and out before the French authorities found out. In fact, the French, the governor of the Comoros Islands had telegraphed to France, but because of the timing, hadn't received a response. And so basically, while they were flying back in the air, the French authorities were freaking out, saying, don't let it out of the country. And they were like, oh. So basically, they got the second seal calf and described uh, it more formally for the world, and the French were pissed about it ever since. So there it is there. And uh, there's lots of books written about this. This is uh, one that I've read, which I really liked. I highly recommend it. Really fun. Okay, so what do we know about these things now, Actinistia? Well, there's one or two species. You'll hear more about that in a second. Uh, they're found in the Western Indian Ocean. There's the Comoros Islands there off of Mozambique. Uh, they have this cool three-lobed tail. They're found quite deep, which is why people hadn't captured them before in very rocky habitats where trawlers don't tend to go. Uh, and they seem to eat fish and cephalopods. Uh, another funny uh, anecdote to the story is that um, since they were in the Comoros Islands the, and the French realized that they were there, for a long time after this second one was found, basically the French had a monopoly on coelacanths. And so every seal coelacanth that was captured went to like a French museum. And so every little dinky podunk museum and aquarium throughout France seems to have a seal coelacanth. And so this is one that I saw at random in the town of Biarritz when taking my daughter there 20 years ago, roughly. Uh, and we found a, a seal coelacanth just preserved in 
uh, this tiny little museum and, and aquarium in uh, Biarritz. Whereas the rest of the world, even big museums couldn't get cetylcans until recently. Now to continue with the really sort of cool aspect, uh, uh, serendipitous aspect of this, there was a biologist who was on the honeymoon in Indonesia and he went to a fish market and saw a coelacanth in the fish market in Indonesia. And no one had ever knew that a coelacanth existed there, certainly not Western scientists. Uh, you can see, if you look at the fin, the really cool movement of... Uh, that reflects this, this basal skeletal element that's in the fin, rotating the fin around. Um, and they just sort of hang out in these caves at night. They have this cool behavior where they stand on, on end, uh, which is probably a predatory behavior. And they're just a super cool fish. Just watch the fins and how they're moving them around, almost like a limb. Okay, well, that's uh, lectures about fish and diversity of fishes. I hope you enjoyed them. And uh, you'll see all of the rest of the tetrapods coming up in the subsequent lectures in Animal Diversity, Biology 305.